All right, so this is, I've been struggling with this one. So today we're gonna to talk about social media revolutions, but first I need to get something out of the way. This is not something as easy as I thought it would be to talk about anymore. This used to be something that was like, oh, really interesting. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit more about how interesting this is. So I need to forefront this, okay? I've tried to record this like several times and it doesn't work in the order it's supposed to. I was gonna give you a history of revolutions and the outcome and how collective action is important. It is. But I need to forefront this and say that the last decade has seen dozens of social media revolutions, all of which have left me fairly hopeful and optimistic. On the other hand, the tools in which we use social media to create revolutions or activate or collectively organize have been wildly misused by the far right and QAnon. And those misuses aren't helpful to us in any civic manner whatsoever. In any way, they seem like the social media revolutions of the past, but they're being misused now to gather in Dallas, Texas to await the arrival of JFK Jr. as he ascends the throne as Vice President of the United States. If that doesn't make sense to you, you live in a far better world than I do. But if that does make sense to you, you understand that they're using the same tool sets that are out there and engageable when we're talking about social media revolution. So let me just forefront that. So first, let me go through and explain some background. The social media revolutions are a new, new thing, okay? There's two different sides to this and we're gonna address them. One, the ability to collectively, to create collective action and be, do something in physical space. Two, the opposite, clicktivism. The ability to think you're doing something but you're really only sharing videos. Okay, so those are uh, opposites but ranked somewhere in the same place as what we consider digital activism. I teach an entire class on this in the master's level here at QC called Digital Activism Lab. It's uh, next semester I'll be teaching it. I'm really looking forward to it. It's one of my favorite courses at QC because we talk about what is digital activism. Uh, on this pile of books right here, uh, there's a couple of, that's actually the, the book list <laughs> right there for the class, but it's, uh, it's about how do we understand digital activism in physical spaces. Let me give you a brief history of social media revolutions. Let's start from the big first one, the Arab Spring, or the Occupy movements, which happened basically simultaneously. The Arab Spring goes all the way back to December of 2010. In December of 2010 in Tunisia, uh, a man named Muhammad Bouazizi was being bribed for um, his daily fruit delivery. And as usual, uh, on his daily uh, commute, he would basically have to go through a checkpoint. And one day he lost his shit. Uh, the best way to describe it is he was so mad because somebody stole his scale. And it was actually a bureaucrat, somebody who worked for the government stole his scale. And the only way to get his scale back is he has to knock on the door and pay a bribe and get his scale back. And this was kind of like a secondary market of the corrupt Tunisian government. You see, at the time, the president had been president for 37 years. Across the Middle East, in several different countries, presidents had been presidents for over three decades. There was a tension in the crowd that made people understand that it was not only that the presidents had been in power for too long, but the times had changed so vastly that how could they be even connected to a present day understanding of anything in any way? So there was obviously this anger that was coming and a feeling of powerlessness that came from the people around them. People had tried to revolt many times in Tunisia to no avail. In this case, it would have been the same. Muhammad Bouazizi uh, went up to the place in front of the uh, bureaucratic office, poured gasoline on himself, and self-immolated. He burned himself alive right in front of the office. You see, this has happened before. This has happened in many cases, and unfortunately, these things happen all too often. But in this case, someone took a photo. Someone had video of Muhammad Bouazizi burning himself. And that photo ended up in northern Tunisia, where a young man decided to post it on Facebook. And when he posted it on Facebook, he already had an influencer network. And this influencer network crossed over from Tunisia into France, and people recognized the, the horrible situation that Tunisians were under, and a revolution began. What was known as the Arab Spring. What made it even worse is that the president of Tunisia decided to show up to Muhammad Bouazizi's hospital bed. And there's a famous photo of him standing there of this man burned almost to death. And he's standing there gleefully showing his support. When it was very clear from that photo, it was not support in any way. Over the course of the next year, three of four governments had toppled, Tunisia, Libya, and Egypt. 
Syria being the only one that didn't. Syria is still in a civil war since that era and before that. These governments toppled because social media enabled the public to not only learn about the atrocities, but to use it to collectively take action. And that collective action is really important because it's really the only way in which people can activate collectively and make a difference. In the toppling of a government, though, we forget that in but in the lack of a government doesn't mean a new government just appears. It means that you have to work hard to create a new government. And to this day, the Egyptian government is still under military rule. 2011. In the beginning of 2011, in the, uh, in the early part of the year, during the Arab Spring, in July of that year, a magazine called Ad Busters from Canada, which once read the uh, vanguard of pushing back against ads in the early 2000s, posted uh, a, basically an ad and said, what we need to do is use the concepts that were done in the Arab Spring, the occupation of Tahrir Square, which is what they did in Egypt, that they occupied that square for uh, months. In fact, it, it, the documentary is still on Netflix and you should watch it, it's graphic, uh, called The Square. It is the history of the, uh, the Arab Spring. And uh, Adbusters said we should occupy Wall Street. The problem with that is that they didn't tell you what to do once you've occupied it. They said, once we get there, we'll figure out what to do and we'll make sure that Wall Street sees us. You see, this worked and it didn't work. People occupied Wall Street, they did. And it was they were there for quite some time. They were there until they were thrown out of Zuccotti Park. The movement stays on in many different countries as Occupy movements. The term the Occupy movements comes from both Three Square and Occupy Wall Street. The thing that doesn't work out is that later, the following year, people started thinking about this as a tool set. How do we get people to take action in a collective manner? And one of the ways in which it worked was a video, which you're not gonna watch for this class, but would be in my others, is a video called Coney 2012, which was a phenomenon. And Coney 2012 was collectivism. It maybe made people think they were taking action because they simply shared the video. Uh, it's, uh, to, in retrospect, it's, it's a grift, okay? It was, it was a fairly big grift, and uh, it's too much to unpack in this little bit of time. The 2010s saw a fair, fair amount of revolutions that appeared, disappeared, and reappeared in different parts all over the world, being activated and aggravated by social media. Finally, the big year, 2020. Now, I'm going to skip over 2016 uh, and the election of Donald Trump, all right? So those were big... Uh, social media revolutions as well, but they were in reaction to an election uh, and they are more civic than they are social media. But in 2020, we did have a civic movement, uh, Black Lives Matter movement in the wake of the George Floyd Matt murder. In that time, the BLM movement, which was founded on the internet, became a major movement that allowed people all over the country to show in number how much race relations matter to how we understand our civic spaces. You see, protest is protected by your First Amendment for a very important reason. It's the ability to assemble peacefully. That's what's in the First Amendment. And protest is about visibility of constituency. So the fact that we can go out in physical space and create physical change means that representatives have to pay attention. They don't have a choice when there's that much volume of people. And it's important. If we don't do this, there's always this phrase, if you don't fight for your rights, you lose your rights. And protest is our most valuable asset to do that because it actually shows people's willingness to use their human body as an occupation of space, as movement, and in voice. It is a comb combination act. And that combination act is really, really important to making sure our voices can be heard. However, one of the things that have bothered me over the course of time is the misuse of these acts, is civics for fiction or fiction for civics. The same tools that gather people together can be misused, misused for reasons that we're not really good at um, confronting well. One of the ways in which it was misused, and I'll give you a prime example using BLM, is Blackout Tuesday, which was on June 2nd of 2020. And there was a misguided venture that we would use a black box to post on social media to prove our solidarity with black folk that were being persecuted by our, margin, our, our terribly imbalanced government. However, by using the hashtag BLM or Black Lives Matter, those black boxes were actually disrupting the flow of what that hashtag was useful for. 
That hashtag wasn't just a movement in physical space, it was actually an aggregator, the way that hashtags are supposed to be used. When you click a hashtag, it's supposed to show you everything that's associated with that thing. Typically, that hashtag was meant for uh, local action. It was to show you food banks or protest sites or informational things. Now, all of a sudden, you couldn't see anything. It was just black boxes. It almost felt as if it was by design to, to disrupt that flow. Those tools can be used as systems to engage negatively or positively. In this case, it was probably a well-meaning instance that went awry, but in some cases, it's designed as a shitpost, as a disruptor to the flow. And in that case, newly, QAnon has basically used these same tools to collectively take action and show up at school of board meetings, as we've probably talked about in other classes. They've used social media to agitate using outrage bait and claim that schools are being taken over by the woke liberal mob by teaching critical race theory. There is in Virginia, for example, which has outlawed the teaching of critical race theory, there is currently zero schools that teach it. Before the banning, there was currently zero classes that taught it. In other words, it's made up. It's completely fictional. It doesn't exist. Christopher Rufo, the person who came up with a plan to make critical race theory a negative aspect, which by the way, critical race theory is a legal uh, argument that is not taught in schools because it would be taught at the graduate school level. Uh, but it was made as a weaponized system of the far right, so it would become something that becomes policy. The revolution, the social media revolution, took place online. It was activated in Facebook groups as an agitator, as outrage bait. It is the same tool set, it is for a different means. Where we're supposed to be being taught uh, the reason to go to school is to be taught new ideas, things that push the boundaries, things that change our minds, things that open our minds to new ideas. Isn't that what school is for? Dangerous thoughts that could be expressed. But instead, the idea of cancel culture is really a weapon. It is not really designed specifically to uh, victimize people who say dangerous things about what they think they are. What they want to say is that they're not allowed to say things that make them get canceled, which in their case would be racist epitaphs. Yeah, that is not appropriate behavior. But in turn, they create policy using social media backups to basically ban people from incorporating and engaging people with ideas that are supposed to make us more aware of the structural indifferences that are out there. Regardless of how you feel about whatever that is, it, the problem is, is that the tool set doesn't engender a positive behavior from good faith actors doing good acts. What it does is it engenders or enables bad faith actors to use the tools to their own advantage. So again, like I said, I started recording this and thinking about how I'm going to tell the story of social media revolutions. And there's a lot to talk about and so important as it can be. But I think the big takeaway that I want you to get from this is that we need to be responsible for these tools and we need to be responsible for our civic action. We need to recognize the difference between clicktivism, the ability to share information, and the ability to congregate in physical spaces to disrupt social good. There is a responsibility to our future that if we're not going to maintain and understand, we're going to literally lose it. And I know this kind of ends this on like a weird negative note, but you have to understand that social media revolutions are still only a decade old in, in terms of how it works. And there's been this utopian view that maybe the net will change the world. But until we get a hold on what is or is not acceptable use of social media revolutions, we always run the factor of if you revolt, a revolution results in a vacuum and you've got to fill the vacuum with something. And if you don't fill it with something, bad actors will fill it instantly because people, some people have a plan. We have to keep those who are marginalized most in our minds when we start thinking about this, that some people do not have the same access as we all do to some pieces of technology, to our vocal speeches, to the ability to express ourselves. And we have to interrogate these structures. It's important to interrogate them because if we don't interrogate them, we allow a top-down movement. We allow a guy like Mark Zuckerberg to decide for us how the world will work in the future. When in theory, the only way uh, Facebook works is by our content being added to the site, which means we, by being participants in the platform, should tell Facebook how it should be operating, not the other way around. But that is going to take a social media revolution, and I'm not sure how long we have until that is necessary at our time. But we're going to have to do it sooner than later, 
or there's not going to be anything left for us to have a say in. So for homework tonight, really, this is just a week to catch up. I need you to get your uh, midterm in. Uh, I want you to um, catch up with all of your work. Okay. There's a lot of readings on here for the social media revolution. It will come back next week. I'm going to ask you to post your, uh, the, the topic of your, so your final project. So the, the rubric for the final project is a project called you are new media. Okay. And what it is, is you're supposed to take the part of this class that has impacted you the most up until today and, and through the end, the rest of the class is going to be on social media marketing and how to amplify and leverage your own personal brand into digital space, which I think is important. Find what impacts you the most during the semester. The semester is filled with a survey of material, things that you love, things that you hate, things that you learned, things that changed your mind. And you're going to make a video or a PowerPoint or a, an essay. You're going to make a multimedia project one way or another. It has to be some bit of interactive. And here's why. You're going to find out something that you really loved about this class and you're going to be the teacher. You're going to explain it to somebody who's never taken this course. I've prompted this in little ways before, but now I'm going to prompt it in a big way. You're going to create a mini lecture like I do here, and you're going to explain it to like a grandma or an aunt or a friend, somebody who you want somebody to learn about something that we went over in this class that you want somebody else to gain that knowledge from. You be the teacher. You be the expert. I mean, you took this class. You're the expert now. You should be able to do it. So next week, by next week, I want you to post your... Um, your thesis, basically what thing you're going to do for your final project. And then you'll have to the end of the semester to basically put that together. So till then, you know, the usual stay curious, stay healthy and stay vigilant.